between man and machine, woman and machine. And where we start seeing that data is so valuable, shouldn't we start thinking about how that can be distributed? There might be different values on this. I might be cutting corners, but in the Western world, we're very individualistic, right? Individual rights, human rights, fundamental rights, my privacy. Yeah? But there are societies which have a different approach to this. I'll give you an example, China. There is, is it Alipay, I think, uh, that has started a system of social uh, ranking. So basically, you enter a system, which is quite useful and handy for your day-to-day -day stuff, whereby everything that you do in your life, moving by transport, your insurance, and the rest of it, is recorded. And then you're given a certain social class in that. And then suddenly, if you do something wrong, you can be dropped out of that. For me, that's a scary thought. That's probably more uh, George Orwell than Aldous Huxley. But we don't have any simple answers. All I'm trying to say is that we need some kind of a regulation on this. Yeah? Some kind of an ethical code. And here we come to my third and final point. The first one was economics, the other one was politics, and the third one is, is science. Here I go back to Yuval Harari again. You know, his argument would be that basically Homo sapiens has three phases. One is when we are flesh and blood, bones, nervous systems, human beings, you and I. Huh? We're all different, but kind of the same. We're all sort of born equal, yeah? It's a good thing. We don't always have equal opportunity because we're born in different times. But this is us. We're flesh and blood. Second phase, we become hybrids or cyborgs. Do you think you're a cyborg today? I think I'm kind of, I kind of am. Yeah, you got the mobile phone there. You know, try to live without this for a day, a week, <laughs> a month. Yeah, I mean, we can move into the forest and do it. It's no, no problem, but, but, well, a bit of a challenge. But, you know, um, we're not the, like the, the hunter-gatherers of the old days. We're very linked to this all the time. We're dependent on it. Where we go, what we do, what we buy, how we live. And we're moving closer and closer to this singularity with, with the machine, right? Through artificial intelligence and artificial we, we become very dependent on it. And then the third phase would be when we detach ourselves from humanism, from being human beings and homo sapiens and become machines. I, I don't think we're going to you know, go there. But some people think that that's also possible. But there are going to be huge ethical issues linked to all this, right? And I'll just give you a few examples. Uh, my biggest worry is that we will truly start creating separate type of classes. Because you'll go into a system whereby technology, DNA manipulation, biometrics will be given to the selected few because they have the financial means to do that. I'll give you a few examples. Isn't it great that science has advanced to the stage where we can do a liver transplant or a heart transplant? Or that we have basically eradicated disease as the number one cause of death? Or war and violent crime as the number one cause of death? Or famine as the number one cause of death? We've basically been able to sort this out. Not perfectly, but compare again to life in the 1800s or early 1900s. Look what we died in. I mean, we died to disease, we died in famine, we died in wars, right? But now we've been able, through medicine and societal development, to fix a lot of these problems. And isn't it great that you can grow an ear on a mouse, take that ear, put it on a human being, and perhaps that human being can hear? Good stuff. Or isn't it great that you can, through medicine and science, improve the life of a child who has a life-threatening disease? Let's push it a little bit further. How about if you had a 10-year-old child who had a hereditary disease 
and that hereditary disease could be cured by medication, what would you do? You'd of course give that medication to the child. Push it one step further. What if your child, like me, is not mathematically talented or oriented, but you know that for future work it's very important that that kid knows maths a bit better. Would you give an injection to that child that would improve that child's capacity to deal with mathematical problems? I don't know. It doesn't feel right, does it? But what would they do it in North Korea? <laughs> I don't know. But we're going to have a lot of these huge ethical questions which are so closely linked to human beings. Next example. Isn't it great that if I lost my arm, modern medicine or medicine in 20 years would basically be able to provide me with a new arm in replacing the amputated arm, which could be controlled by neural laces in my brain, which would make it look just like a normal arm. Isn't that fun? And isn't it fun that, you know, then a friend of mine, because you're tapping on a computer there, so you would be programming, say, okay, now it's time to go into Alex's neural lace and have Alex hit himself. And everyone would go, oh, that looks a little bit stupid. But what if there was a cybersecurity attack on that neural lace and I would take out a gun and start shooting? Pretty scary, isn't it? So what I'm trying to say is that there are lots of moral, ethical, legal questions that we're going to have to deal with as we start approaching this combination of, of technology and biology being brought into one. And take it one step further. When it comes to your privacy and data, that's already a big thing. But what if at some stage that privacy and data can lead to your DNA being manipulated? Isn't that the fundamental thing of being a human being and who you are? Am I trying to scare you with this? No. I'm trying to say that in the next 50 years we're going to have very many interesting questions that have to do with us as homo sapiens. How perhaps a future human being can be hacked or, or not hacked. And here we come then to my conclusion. I've gone a little bit over time. I've spoken for half an hour. I'll, I'll stop here. There are three ways of, of dealing with all of this. And I, I, I steal this idea from a wonderful book that I, I, I read by Max Tegmark. It's called uh, Life 3.0. And Max Tegmark says that there are three schools of thought in all of this. The first school of thought uh, is what he calls the, 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 the optimists. The optimists say that, hey, artificial intelligence, no problem, singularity, you know, let the machines take care of the mundane tasks. Uh, you know, it'll be like Adam Smith's invisible hand. It'll work out to sort itself out at the end of the day. Yeah, artificial intelligence can beat us in chess, they can beat us in Jeopardy, they can beat us in Go, but you know, we're still, you know, self-learning is a good thing and machine learning and the rest of it. Fine. Then second school of thought are the AI pessimists. They say that, eh, Alex, don't worry about it. It ain't going to happen in another 150 years. The world is going to be a very different place and... And, and, you know, you really don't need to worry about singularity or artificial intelligence taking over. Yeah, there might be a few cyber attacks on uh, uh, energy centers or something like that, but, you know, don't worry about it. And then there's a third school of thought to which I would say a lot of modern or late thinkers like Stephen Hawkins belong to, and they call it benign AI. So kind of AI for good if you will, where the thinking is that, yeah, artificial intelligence, digitalization, robotization gives us a lot of freedom and does a lot of good things, but the truth is that it does need to be regulated. We have to make sure that instead of, you know, this juxtaposition, human and robot, these should cooperate. So perhaps we should call ourselves cobots, you know? You have these two working together. But the human being is always in the driver's seat. And this is one of the big problems in our thinking about artificial intelligence and robots. We've been watching too many uh, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger uh, 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 movies where 
you know, human beings start looking like robots and acting like robots and the rest of it. And this is not what it's all about. It's something much more sophisticated and, and complicated than that. And here's where I, I finish off with. But one thing is for sure, that, and, and you know, call me a softie or whatever you want to, but, but I mean, one thing is for sure that technology is starting to dominate our lives. Hmm? Uh, you know, how many of you have breakfast with your friends, girlfriends, boyfriends, family, and everyone's sort of... <laughs> okay, I have a night. Okay, what, what did you say? Yeah. So the world is coming closer to us all the time, right? It is smaller. The virtual world is there, you know. We communicate to our friends in Portugal or Zambia or, or whatever. But at the same time, we get more and more detached from the real world, from, you know, you and I. Look, Timo is filming this, right? We look at life through the lens of a mobile phone without observing and smelling and the rest of it. So what I'm trying to, and you as well. So what I'm trying to say is that, you know, as we approach a stage in life where technology dominates, remember one thing, that what we're really left with at the end of the day is empathy and the way in which we deal with other human beings. And you know, you're as bad at that as I am. I'm probably worse. But always remember that. So at the end of the day, it's going to be about the interaction that you have with another human being. It's not going to be about the interaction that you have with that machine. And that's in many ways, I think, one of the things that, that we should keep in mind as this technological digital revolution progresses. So, ladies and gentlemen, in, in 35 minutes, I do apologize for going a little bit over. These were my sort of two cent, cents worth on, on the digital revolution. Economic impact and labor, huge. Political impact, yeah, massive. Impact on science, huge as well. And these are wonderful things to, 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 to think about. And also lovely times to live in as well, to be able to understand all of this. Uh, and this is why I've been such an happy student of the subject for the past few years. Uh, and this is where I hand it over to you for questions which are either posed by artificial intelligence or by yourselves. <coughs> so thanks. <coughs>